Bonjour, chers collègues. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce Professor Jean-Marie Jean Conrad for the art du lecture this morning. En effet, on était deux jeunes ingénieurs euh, sur le chantier de la Baie James des années 70, et c'est là qu'on a vraiment travaillé ensemble, et depuis ce temps, nos chemins professionnels se croisent plus souvent. Professor Conrad obtained a diploma d'ingénierie, University in French in 1975, and MSc in civil engineering from the University of Laval in 1977, and a PhD of the University of Alberta in 1980, where he contributed to the de development of force heat mechanics. Dr. Conrad worked in the private sector as a geotechnical engineer for Lavalin, for the James Bay Project, for the National Research Council, and as professor of the University of Waterloo. From 1998, to 2008, he was the chairholder of the Industrial Research Chair on Force Action and Civil Engineering Structure. He is now the Professor in Civil Engineering at the University Laval and as the chairholder of Civil Engineering for Industrial Chair on the Optimization of the Life Cycle of Embankment Dams. For the last 12 years, he was also a consenting for various projects related to this artificial freezing, dam construction, and safety assessment. Professor Conrad is the author or the co-author of over 150 technical papers and has awarded fellow in 1999 by the Canadian Academy of Engineering and fellow in 2003 by the Engineering Institute of Canada. So ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Professor Jean-Marie Conrad. Merci, Monsieur Nguyen, pour cette révision d'une rétrospective d'une d'une carrière de plus de 35 ans déjà. Euh, messieurs les Présidents, au québec Société canadienne, euh, Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and Gentlemen, c'est à mon tour de présenter euh, Bob Hardy, cet éminent géotechnicien que l'on peut considérer euh, un peu comme le père de la mécanique des, des sols au Canada. Il a fondé euh, une, une des meilleures firmes de géotechnique de l'Ouest canadien, Hardy Associates, et a reçu beaucoup d'honneurs au cours de sa carrière, dont l'Ordre du Canada. C'est donc un immense honneur que d'être sélectionné de vous présenter l'allocution Hardy cette année. As I said, I'm extremely pleased, and it's a great honor to present to you this. Uh, 2015 Hardy Lecture here in uh, Quebec City that I consider that my hometown. I came from France about 40 years ago, and uh, since then, probably I'm more Canadian now than, than French. Um, the title of my presentation has two words, design and analysis of Rockfield dams, past, present, and future. And uh, let us first define these terms so that we don't get mixed up when we talk about analysis and design. Rockfield dams must be safe and stable during all phases of construction and operation of the reservoir. This means that design is not completed until the dam is built and the reservoir is in successful operation. So design is, is about selection of materials zoning, geometry of the dam, core thickness, freeboard, crest details, construction specifications, design criteria, and so on. And it is essentially based on judgment guided by precedent and past experience. And you'll see more and more a little bit on analysis. But we must 
understand that dam design is really of an empirical nature and there is a degree of conservatism that is built into the design that eventually could be reduced, downgraded, downsized, modified by adequate analysis. About analysis, we need to perform analysis to assess rock fill dam performance. You check that the dam behaves as planned or anticipated during construction, but also to check that the design criteria are uh, observed. We also want to monitor the performance of completed dam and assure that it remains in a stable conditions for its lifetime. And finally, to obtain basic information to assist in the economical design of future dam. That sounds strange because in the 80s we thought with James Bay we finished building dams, but now we have another big uh, complex ongoing at La Romaine, and we'll talk more about that. So that brings me to the outline. We uh, will briefly review the design practice at Hydro-Québec, and then talk about innovative research, uh, stressing something that I uh, did recently that is going back to the basic of uh, particle breakage to assign rock fill properties, and then to see, and to see whether centrifuge testing could be a, a design tool. And finally, uh, if we have time, the, the problem related to the seepage is always an important part of our consideration for the safety of dams. But there is a new uh, topic that emerged recently is about contact erosion. So it's something that I would like to share with you. Future developments, I think I'll stick to just the numerical modeling. Uh, what is the future of numerical modeling? Bring a conclusion and, of course, a lot of acknowledgement because this work that I present here is not just my work, it is the work of the whole team that is working in that IRC Industrial Research Chair and with Hydro-Quebec. The context, the existing dams, we have a lot of them here, as you will see, it's more about analysis because we need to analyze the performance to understand, but also that we have a new law on dam uh, safety. And fortunately, this is the version minus one. So that's bad, but that's okay. So uh, I changed that this morning and somehow uh, we, it didn't get through. But uh, really uh, the, the ID uh, of the dam safety, it's not 1996, this was the reason for that uh, law. It was the flooding in, in um, um, uh, Sagne and uh, the law is in place since 2002. Anyway, it's to ensure minimum safety standards against floods and earthquakes, to, to make sure that uh, peoples are protected and that our, our assets are also protected, and uh, that we uh, have for the owner the uh, requirement to do uh, maintenance and uh, regular surveillance of the water retaining structures. Hydro-Quebec owns over 500 earth dams, so does the, uh, the government of Quebec, about 800, and it's the government that is responsible for enforcing this, the new law. New dams, as I said, La Romaine hydroelectric project is located on the north shore of the St. Lawrence River across Anticosti, and it consists of constructing four dams, Romaine 1 to Romaine 4, and the project spans from 2009 to 2020. So that is more addressing than the, the, the the design of the dams. What kind of dams we're talking about? Essentially, we have ECRDs, that is earth core uh, rock fill dams. And in Quebec here, we have uh, compacted till cores. And this ensures the imperviousness of our structure. Uh, the cores are not strong in terms of uh, shearing resistance. Hence, they need to be once protected by filter transition for seepage and rock fill shell for stability. 
We also have ACRDs, which is uh, asphaltic core rockfield dams that has a thin asphalt core in its center. We have one such in Quebec, and we have CFRDs that are thin concrete face rockfield dams. What about those structures? How high are they? We have the highest one, uh, Nurek, uh, 300 meters for ECRDs. But you see Mica Dam, Bennett Dam in Canada, they have 240 meters, 183, and here in Quebec, SM3, 170, LG2, LG4, which are James Bay structures, <coughs> 160, 125 meters. ACRD, the tallest is Finsterstall in Austria, 150 meters, but Romain II is the first ACRD structures built in North America and is uh, 112 meter high. We talk more about Romain II in the course of this presentation. And in terms of the concrete face Rockfield Dam, we have one dam that is Tulnustuk, 77 meter high. The design practice at Hydro Quebec. We now are the fourth generation of dams. I go very quickly over the first generation. They were built before the 40s, 1940s, and have not much uh, geotechnical concepts in them. Uh, but as we, we move on, we see that there is more and more geotechnical engineering that enters into the dam. And strangely enough, it's also connected with the improvement of the construction equipment, as you will see on those pictures. The second generation, we had Hydro-Québec had, had uh, consultants such as Casagrande and Bierum for uh, the, the, the specific challenges that were met uh, on those structures. They are morely related to the Manicouagan River Basin. The uh, third generation is the one that uh, Fong and I worked on, is the James Bay. So we worked on LG3. And uh, as you see, the compacting uh, equipment, again, are much, uh, have improved. And there is more and more advanced engineering concept that entered into the design uh, uh, phases. Finally, the fourth generation is from 2000 on and now, and is mainly related to the La Romaine II uh, project. And as you see, this is a nice picture showing how thin that asphaltic core is, is placed at the same time as the uh, adjacent uh, filter materials are put in place by the, uh, the uh, roller compactors. Design, as I said, um, probably the most realistic procedure for ensuring the competence of a rock fill dam is to enforce performance specifications or material placement specifications. For instance, for the till core, compacted till core, we would specify the lift thickness, 45 centimeters, compaction equipment, pneumatic 50 tons or equivalent, and a uh, moisture content during the placement, which is related to the Proctor optimum here. What do we want to get out from that spec is that we have a target density that is uh, larger or equal to the standard Proctor optimum. For granular material, the specs are a bit different. We, um, or not the specs, but the, um, the target is, for instance, uh, it, this, the lift thickness depends on the maximum size, of course, of the particle, and basically, we have four passes of a vibratory roller of nine ton. Uh, we uh, visited China in uh, 2011, Fong and myself, and found that the people were using uh, compacting uh, equipment up to 30 ton for their high CFRD dams. And you see, I put on purpose the Roman II specs uh, for Rockville, 600 millimeter and less, uh, the thickness is 0.9 meters, but we use a vibratory equipment of 15 ton and eight passes based on field test trials. But you can already see here there is a, a marked difference because since it was the first ACRD dam in North America and that we did not want that uh, thin membrane of asphalt to, to get too uh, deformed, I mean, we 
uh, make sure that the specs and had uh, a great, uh, would lead to a lot of compactness on, on in the dam, within the dam. So that was the introduction and the review is a brief, but what about Rockfield properties? That's the most difficult uh, property to sign for the design and even for the analysis. And it's due to the size of the particle and even the concepts of soil mechanics somehow do not really easily apply. So we took the view to uh, look at the particle itself. How does a particle behave when it is uh, stressed? And when you look at uh, maximum stresses in, in the dam, we have uh, up to three megapascal in the dry downstream conditions. But on the upstream, we have, because of buoyancy, we have less uh, stresses, but we have a fact that the rock fill is saturated, so it becomes weaker, as you will see. We also have problems between contrasting rigidity layers, so we get along uh, uh, the materials, we get shear stresses that develop. This is also not very good for the particle. And uh, so we decided to look at particle breakage to link particle breakage to actually the settlement of the dams. First, let us understand particle. It's, it's interesting that when you crush a particle, uh, an ideal spherical particle here, you see it fails in traction. It's like the Brazilian test in concrete. So we compress the particle, it, it opens by splitting, and it's an indirect measure of tensile strength. When you have an irregular particle, instead of uh, taking the, the, the size of the particle, you can take the area of a breakage. This is a typical uh, particle uh, response when it is loaded. We have the blue arrows here will show that we get contact crushing, spalling, we get asperities that go, but when we have the catastrophic failure, it, it happens like a diametral breakage. This is, the, this is the load that we take to calculate our tensile strength. And uh, when we look at the results we did on Roman II uh, granite, then we see that um, the um, uh, strength is increasing as the particle size decreases. And this is making, this is making sense uh, since uh, the, the breakage is really related to a phenomena called is the, the, the crack propagation failure. Is a, a fracture mechanism failure. And, and you see the defect would increase in particles with increasing size. So it's, it's somehow intuitive that the strength would decrease with increasing size of the particle. It's also interesting to compare glass beads to uh, angular Roman II material. We see the glass beads are stronger. And this is due to the, um, to the, the shape. So keep that in mind, please. But even for glass beads, the larger the glass beads are and the less strength we have. Now, we also scanned over 70 years of uh, literature review on, on the topic. This topic is funny, has been studied in the early 40s and um, out of curiosity first. And as uh, the, the decades passed, we got more and more interested to look at it from an engineering point of view. But it, it is clear that the mineralogy of the grain plays a, a great role. And you see the strongest minerals are quartz. And, uh, then, and the weakest would be um, uh, limestone in the, the green triangular at the bottom of the graph. And we also see, um, oops, sorry, that the, this is glass, angular glass, and this is uh, glass beads. Again, the, the shape of the particle plays an important role. Now that we understand that we have a single particle that can split when it is uh, compressed, uh, let us uh, study the assemblages of a lot of particles. And how we do that, we, we, have, we, we can use odometric compression tests in small cells for sands, larger cells for, for gravels. 
We can also do these triacial compression uh, tests. And this is more or less what happens when the particles are in contact. We have a force chain that develops. So you see that uh, the blue lines will show how the particle would be uh, actually solicited and then how they would, would split open with that cartoon. We can see that now this is a bit excessive that the particle will not crush in like a glass, but it will actually split and change its grain size. Romain II in an endometric cell, initial, we took a fairly uniform uh, material, 5, 10 millimeters. And after odometric loading to about 200 megapascal, we have here crushed uh, or fragmented, if you want, the material to different, to much smaller size. And this is illustrated here on this relationship between uh, grain size, in the initial distribution in red, and progressively it moves to the ult what I call the ultimate grain size distribution where it becomes more or less stable with further loading. So, to summarize the past findings on grain breakage, they used to call it grain crushing, but I think it's more, breakage is more appropriate. Uh, it, as I said, it was studied since the 40s by many people. Some of them we know quite well. It was Marshall uh, in, in, in Mexico. Marius Roy did his PhD thesis with Kwan Lo from Western University. When Kwan was at Laval University, he did that in the 70s. Uh, Yamamuro, you know Bolton, Biarez, Ishe, Fukumoto, Kolyadangu, and more recently Alonso in Barcelona. So we now know particle breakage depends essentially on size of particle, mineralogy, shape, angular versus rounded, grain size distribution, Uniform versus well-graded. Obviously, well-graded uh, material will be more resistant to further uh, grain size changes than uniform material, as you will see in a minute. State is uh, saturated versus the uh, dry state. Saturated will be less resistant. So there will be a difference between upstream shell behavior and downstream shell behavior. And stress path. This stress path dependency always bugged us, so we were trying to understand it from a different point of view, and we were looking at, before we go further into the study of grain breakage and how it influences dam behavior, we, need, we needed to understand for all possible stress path situations. So we went to do a conceptual model that was supposed to capture the evolution of the grain size distribution towards its ultimate state. To do that, we, we also went back and checked what nature is doing. So nature is, in fact, bringing materials such as till, basal till, to its ultimate state by completely crushing it and moving by the, when, as the glacier is moving. So uh, we have in the literature People have used fractal distributions to explain that the number of particles would increase as the size of the particle is decreasing. And another such uh, observation was done along faults. When the fault is moving, it will actually, the shear stresses induced during the movement will actually uh, break down uh, the structure, the rock structure, and finally come to that uh, fractal distribution that is uh, uh, characterized in a log log distribution by the slope of that relationship between number of particle and size of particle. So this is what we then uh, chose to use for defining the ultimate grain size distribution during crushing or fragmentation. So what you have to do is to change a bit your, your habits, and instead of using an arithmetic scale for percent finer, we use a log scale, so log log, and you see that the ultimate uh, distribution here in red is, is a straight line in such a plot, and we take the slope of that line as the representation of the ultimate grain size distribution. So one parameter, and we have the grain size curve distribution quite easily. We went back to the, all the data we, we did ourselves and the ones we found in the literature, 
and have shown that, in fact, the, the slope of that ultimate grain size distribution in a log-log plot can be related to the tensile strength of uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the particle of, uh, of the rock fill. So we see that as the strength is increasing, now strength can increase for two reasons, either because of size is decreasing or because the mineral is stronger. So this is an interesting plot because it has these two effects combined. But we see that the stronger the particle, the, uh, the, the steeper would be the slope. So that means less crushing or fragmentation. But the weaker the particle, the uh, lower is the value of that angle. And therefore, it's flatter. And we get much more uh, crushing fragmentations. And we're going to generate more fines. We also have seen that there is a difference between subangular particles and subrounded particles. Now in dams we have both. Subangular would be the shells when we have clean gravels in transitions or filter zones, clean sands and uh, uh, rounded sand, we're going to have to work with the subrounded particles. Now we are to present how we're going to go to the ultimate state. And this is important because I don't think that many dams have reached the ultimate state. But to understand and to come to a, a model that allows us to know where the dam has ended, we need now to go there, to go to that ultimate state. So we keep, we keep the log-log distribution and we keep the slope of that log-log uh, uh, grain size curve as an indicator of the evolution of the grain size. But as I said, stress pass dependency was not was not a good idea, so we went back and checked out and found that uh, some researchers tried to do the interpretation of these fragmentation tests of assemblages of particles in terms of input energy per unit volume. What is an input energy? Really, it's the, it's the area under a stress-strain curve, as you know. So when we look at data from uh, Marius Roy uh, on uh, limestone, we see he did, in the blue diamonds, he did isotropic compression tests. It's well known that isotropic compression tests do not lead to much crushing because there is no shear. It's an isotropic, so it's on, on, the, on, on a line. There is no shear induced, so there is no, no, no uh, significant uh, fragmentation. But when we compare those tests to the conventional triaxial, there is a lot of shear, and we have the same curve when it is expressed in terms of input energy. So an isotropic compression test inputs less energy, less crushing. A shear test inputs more energy, more crushing. And also French data on uh, hostin sand by Collier d'Angu shows similar results. But now interestingly, we see that there is a critical input energy, when we reach that critical energy, crushing is starting or is proceeding. But before that, grains are not really uh, fragmented, and it's, not, it's really more a re rearrangement type of uh, uh, pro uh, process. So this is very important. Also, it shows that no matter what kind of test we do, we have a unique relationship for the material that we study. So that's the framework that we propose to predict the evolution of grain size distribution. We have a plot in a log a slope of that uh, grain size versus uh, input energy. And as long as the input energy is less than the critical input energy, there is no change in the grain size curve. That's an approximation. There is always change, but the change is not so significant. But once we input more energy than this critical energy, we're going to induce a significant fragmentation of the particles. It's, it's an easy uh, way to mathematically express. And now we need to have the parameters to use. And uh, again, we went to the literature and uh, extracted all the data we could. And we see that we have the slope of that uh, crushing line that can be expressed as a function of uh, uh, tensile strength of the particle. 
and also the position of the line has, has a relationship with respect to that same particle strength. So it's very consistent. And how does it predict? It predicts not bad. The first one is for quartz sand. As you said, this is the most uh, st the strongest particle. And you see, <coughs> we expressed the change in grain size curve by the coefficient of uniformity. It's an easy way to say. And for, for an initial condition at three, we only change up to five for this uh, sand that is quartzitic. But when we have feldspat sand, we go from three to about 20. And in limestone, we have a, a prediction that is not bad that goes up to a coefficient of uniformity of 70. That means that I generated a lot of fine during the crushing process. Again, that would be the ultimate. Now, our, uh, <clears throat> what should I say, our, 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 our goal now is to see where we would stop depending on the situation in the field. Now, this is what I'm going to propose to you right now, is uh, how to apply it to Roman 2. And uh, we have uh, a zone 3.0, that is a 0, 0,600 millimeter rock fill. The parameter tells us that the critical energy would be 0.09 megapascal. And when we look at the deformation data during construction, we see that at the lowest level, where the highest stresses are, we have mobilized only 0.02 megapascal of input energy during uh, the, the placement of the till, uh, of the rock fill. Hence, we can conclude from this study that we will get very little fragmentation in situ, and hence, uh, we should not expect very important settlement. That brings me to the next topic. Is a centrifuge uh, a useful tool for, for dam design? A centrifuge essentially takes a model of a dam and spins it so that the stresses are the ones that we could have in the field. And to, to find the, the factor, we just divide the stress or the height by the acceleration. In this case, we can accelerate up to 160 Gs. And that means that our model should be 0.7 meter high to simulate a dam uh, such as La Romaine II. So that's the idea here is the objective is to use a centrifuge to see is there a difference between a 2D loading system compared to a 1D in the odometer. And uh, the, we did two types of tests. The one on half a structure because of the size of the box. Uh, size of the box only allows us to put about 50 centimeter high uh, structure. So by taking half of it, we were able to model with a surcharge the, the maximum height of Roman II. We did then uh, five tests, four at uh, different densities, uh, and uh, one in a uh, dry condition and one in a saturated conditions. And we used Roman II material that was uh, one inch maximum size, 25 millimeters, with a, a coefficient of uniformity of 12. Typical uh, test for uh, the centrifuge at a high relative density of 94% uh, dry state. We see the stress strain relation is, is almost linear, and that the vertical strain that we measured was about 1%. Now, when we compare the metric test and 2D centrifuge tests, we see that the 2D centrifuge test leads to much higher uh, deformation and is strongly related to placement density. We also see that the uh, saturated uh, condition leads to more settlement. Uh, we can express the same graph in terms of uh, compression modulus, that is simply the ratio of stress divided by vertical strain. But then again, the, the odometric compression test results on the same material would indicate that it's, it's a stiffer material, hence we got less uh, vertical strain, which is obviously. And the centrifuge will ab about lead to about half of that modulus value compared to 1D. Then we, knowing uh, that uh, centrifuge can be used to, to model uh, a simple situation, we then have a simplified Roman II uh, model that was built with a full dam so that we can study the effect 
of filling, first reservoir filling, and to, to monitor additional settlements. So we have a membrane, you see that on the picture below. The membrane is a thin uh, uh, polyurethane membrane, and the water level can be increased once uh, we have the dam constructed, hence we, we already re reach 160 G of spinning. But this time we changed our conditions. We did not study the density effect, we knew that now. <clears throat> we said we do the same relative compaction. Often in dam engineering we like to work with relative com compaction. So it was about 93%. And we changed the grain size distribution and the grain size, uh, maximum grain size to see is there a scale effect. So we have three grain size uh, distributions, one, two, and three. One is uh, well, grade, or well graded with a CU value of 12. The other one is a uniform CU of 1.7. And the third one is smaller grains. Those are typical results during construction. And as you see, the upstream and the downstream, same behavior. It's still fairly linear stress strain curves for the well graded material. And this is for all the material, there is some effect and we see that the, the uniform distribution with the maximum grain size is, uh, is the less rigid in, in response. This is uh, interesting data. This is uh, data that you probably have not seen often. Is the purple line is the reservoir level. Uh, well, anyway, that pointer does not seem to work. And the blue would be the settlement that is induced in the upstream, and the red in the downstream. So we see that the wetting does indeed create more settlement. And this is compared to two uniform grain sizes. And as you see, with the D-max of 25 millimeters, the settlement are larger than when the grains are uh, smaller, which again indicates that there is a scale effect in uh, the behavior of rock fields. <coughs> Going back to the interpretation of those tests, we went back to Marshall and we found that the tensile strength could be more or less a function of one over root square of the particle size. And because we had <coughs> the same material with the same D50, we thought that the weighted diameter would better represent the grain sizes. So we propose a, a weighted diameter approach, dm, for these three grain sizes. And that would be the result of the vertical strain settlement divided by height of the dam. And as a function of one of our root square of d, representative dm, the weighted one. And you see, as when the grain size is, is larger, then the inverse of the root square would be smaller and we get more settlement. First filling, the same thing, upstream settles more than downstream. And now let's see what it gives for Roman II. Roman II was instrumented and uh, Mark Smith from Ido Quebec um, was uh, <coughs> monitoring and giving us the results, which is Excellent collaboration, as usual. And this is inclinometers, uh, vertical inclinometers, horizontal inclinometers to, to, to be analyzed and compared. This is a view of uh, the dam, Roman II, that has been put uh, at full reservoir level in 2014 as scheduled. This is the uh, grain size distribution of zone 30 and uh, with the uh, weighted diameter. Uh, for 3N and for 3P. And those are the settlement, uh, observed settlement at Roman II. This is how we would calculate the uh, strain under a stress of 400 level when we reach mid height. We have 0.24% to 0.5% depending on the size of the material. And this is what it gives when we compare this data to the centrifuge data. So in blue centrifuge at a relative compaction of 93 and 3P, the representative point, 0.5, 30, 
3N. Interesting, this is not that great, we would say. But don't forget, we studied the influence of density we need to correct to go to the same density as in the field. We cannot compare apple and oranges, as you know. So when we do the corrections to go down to a relative compactness of 98% and 100% and extrapolate and put in the scale effect, that is not too bad. You know, we are very close to what we have obtained in the field with a much more complex geometry with more zones than the one we simply used in the centrifuge with a simple liner and some rock fill around it. Now, can we do <coughs> the same for Roman II dam during impoundment? So when we look at the data from the inclinometer, we see that the strain is 0.10%, but the stress now is higher. We have the full dam, so it's 100, 1,100 kPa. And when we do the correction for relative compactness, why do we know it's, by the way, it's 98 and 100%? You remember the specs. We have eight passes of 15 tons of vibratory roller. That thing is, is very heavily compacted. So the, uh, the uh, relative compaction is close to 100% in, in the field. And when we correct for stress effect, size effect, and density effect, the red point, that is the observation, 0.1%, uh, does not compare too badly to the, uh, let's say, inferred point that we would get from the centrifuge data. So to sum up our centrifuge work, <clears throat> this is the lab, centrifuge, and the field in terms of modulus of compression. And we see that the big triangle, I put it big because to take into account for the uncertainty, it shows that we are closer to a 2D behavior, which makes sense, but that basically <coughs> We can take our uh, lab experiment even in the odometer and, and propose proper corrections to anticipate what the behavior would be. Now, uh, let me quickly address core overtopping. And uh, I put it in red, it's not crest overtopping. So we are not having water that flows over the dam crest and bringing in a lot of erosion. We have simply core overtopping. Thank you. Here's my friend. Uh, um, exceptional floods, we have more and more of them because of climate change. Uh, limited evacuation will eventually get to that situation where we have a progressive increase of the reservoir above its normal operation level. And here, and we calculated the position of the phreatic surface uh, to account for unsaturated, saturated flow. And you see that there is a point where water will flow above the core, but not above the dam, which brings there a situation of flow at a contact. Contact core filter, contact core filter on the sides where we have downward flow. And that would be the worst situation. And then the flood would decrease, the evacuation would go on, and we would have here a stable situation again. So core overtopping is about contact erosion, but it's also about pulsing. It's a pulse. It's not something that is steady. It's not something that occurs for 100 years. It's something that occurs for a few days, a few hours. And there is also time lag involved. So one should not get too excited about this situation, but we still had to look at it. So we looked at it from a, uh, first from a um, laboratory point of view, where we uh, build an experimental setup, uh, where we have a horizontal permeometer, and that is shown here on a picture. Basically, we have a uh, till core, and we used Roman 3. So Roman 3 um, is built like an ECRD. So it's, again, conventional uh, dam building. And on top of it, we have placed what we call the filter material. 
heavily instrumented a lot of uh, piezometric uh, um, gauges. And this is what we tested. Uh, Roman 3 till is, is the black line. As you see, very poor in fines. So that was one, uh, one reason why at Roman 2, uh, uh, asphaltic concrete was chosen because uh, the tills probably were supposed not to be that impervious, but in Roman 3, we did test and uh, permeability is adequate to, to proceed. And uh, we tested various filter material to find out do we get significant migration of fines during the contact erosion. And we have here um, you know the well-known filter criteria, D15 of the filter over D85 of the base. We vary that one between 2 and 17. The uh, uniformity coefficient of till was 9, and the depth of the filter material was between 1 and 2. As you see, it's, it's fairly uniform. When we have a filter criteria of 2, D15 over D85 of 2, we have minimal erosion. Even though we had 50 hours of incremental seepage, maximum hydraulic gradients of 1.2, maximum velocity of 0.047 meter per second. This is quite clear. Now, when we go to the other extreme and say, I show you here a D15 over D85 of 17, which is much larger than the four uh, criteria of four or five, depending on, 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 on the agencies, we see we got here we get here particle movement, and uh, but when we go and, and 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 open up, we see that the core lost the fine particles, and that as it lost fine particles, it 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 changed its structure and it became stable, even though I had an initially uh, large ratio of D15 over D85. So this is well known in river engineering. So we went back and checked in river engineering with flow along the bed. It's called paving. And the paving, let me introduce that to you, is the sorting of particle of the teal core at the contact. The lightest particle are first carried away and leaving in place the bigger particle and creating a coarse-grained armor. There is a change in grain size that nature itself is doing. And interestingly enough, when it happens at the end, then uh, there is a difference in hydraulic gradient, which uh, shows that we have differences in materials. But when we look at the, uh, the paving process, this is the grain size of the heavier uh, core material. And initially, it was at a ratio of 17, and with time as as it got eroded, it stabilized. And when you look at the grain size that we measured in the interface, the, uh, the ratio D15 over D85 is down to four. Very good. This means that our filter criteria are not that bad. So the larger particle in the clay core or the till core plays an important role for contact erosion. Again, so we checked. What have we specified at Roman 3? By the way, when I say we, it's not me. It's the team of uh, design that uh, was designing Roman 3, so it's mainly Hydro-Quebec. But Hydro-Quebec specified that we have to obey the filter criteria for the crest material, and these conditions are met at Roman 3. Hence, we would say it should be stable with respect to core overtopping. In the future, we'll do more modeling about uh, the, the transient, um, the transient um, aspect of that, uh, of that uh, problematic, but uh, for right now, we feel confident that this uh, criteria is uh, adequate for Roman 3. Very quickly, when we look at internal erosion, when we have uh, seepage uh, normal to the core, we introduced a new a stability criteria that is based on critical flow velocities. Similarly to uh, a lot of uh, work that has been done in, in, in Hungary about water wells, they didn't want water wells to clog. So it's about the same systems. We don't want 
the fine particles to move out of a core. Although we have filters to catch them, we don't want them to move. And, and that will then make sure that the integrity of the dam is preserved under seepage. When we do that, we have seen the green zone is a stable zone. When the velocity versus a permeability of the material is in that green zone, there is no triggering of particle movement. We apply that to QA1 uh, and uh, using geostatistical mean. It has been published, so I will not spend a lot of time. But basically what we do with geostatistic, we can establish a permeability profile in the core. And uh, with a seepage analysis, we can establish for that permeability profile what are the uh, Darcy velocity. And when we plot on that plot the velocity and the hydraulic conductivity, the, the dam can be characterized by the black dots. These black dots, if they are located under the critical uh, seepage velocity, that's like uh, telling uh, that there is stability with respect to uh, migration of fines. Future developments, really uh, we should address in the future the numerical modeling of dams. There is, we had yesterday a workshop and uh, there is still a lot of work to be done in that field. There is so many uh, publications on, on uh, numerical simulations of dams that we must ask ourselves the questions. Are the constitutive models we use for dams adequate? Uh, what should we use for, for simulation codes? There are many available in commercially available. And what is the confidence level? Those are questions and uh, I'm not sure we have the answers. We also need to upgrade our seismic design and uh, make perhaps more efforts to, to predict permanent deformations because this ultimately when an earthquake strikes, when the dam is settling permanently during during the, the shaking, uh, it becomes an issue. It shouldn't settle too much so that we can still keep the water level below the crest. Constitutive models, the point here is, has been well put forward by Jeffries and Bean. There are two types of model, descriptive uh, constitutive models that are really uh, curve-fitting models, and there is idealized models that are, have more physics in them. And uh, I give you an example of a descriptive model, the famous Duncan Chan model. We, it was calibrated against triaxial tests we did here in dry conditions for uh, Romain II. And then I asked uh, uh, Simon Grenier from Calitas to, uh, to predict what it would give if we take the same parameters in odometric compression because we had also tests for odometric compression, but I didn't give them to him. So it's almost a class A prediction. He didn't know the results. And this is what he came. He would predict with these uh, parameters from Duncan Chen, the, uh, the, the red line, so 10% so strain. And uh, the test we did was uh, the, the black line. So he overpredicted the displacement by, or the vertical strain by three times, which is, is quite significant. So, this is uh, how, how do we apply now this to the dam? Uh, what is our degree of confidence? And then I asked another of my students, uh, Vincent Castonguet, to, to do an idealized model, North Sand. Uh, and this is based on critical uh, state soil mechanics and uh, has a slightly more parameter, but not that many more. It was calibrated against the same experiment, uh, but now in the saturated situation. This is a, a Q epsilon stress strain curve. It has been also tested in the E log P. So it, this is all uh, calibrated. As you see, the uh, solid line is modeled. The dotted line is uh, experimental. And this is the prediction. So it's not yet perfect, but there is not a three-time difference between the solid lines and the dotted lines. So present the conclusions to you. Assessment of rock field properties considering rain breakage and scale effect is, is possible and uh, should be considered for all uh, rock field dams. Analysis of centrifuge data considering scale effect and density state uh, can it indeed give us some idea about uh, future dam behavior. Internal stability under seepage can be related to a permissible flow velocity for a given hydraulic conductivity. 
And it leads with your statistical analysis to a definition of a kind of a safety with respect to onset of particle migration of uh, dam cores. The conditions for no contact erosion during uh, core overtopping for Roman 3, at least for Roman 3, is, is really satisfy the filter criteria. And I would suggest, uh, but it's a suggestion, it only is me talking, but it's, it's me in my, in my spirit. I don't like complicated things. I like simple things. So I would favor the use of idealized soil models based on physical meaningful parameters for the analysis of Rockfield Dam performance. This is what we would like to do. Again, dam design is empirical in nature. It is also uh, based sometimes on established uh, practice. So it's not just empirical, we have a lot of dams we can actually draw from. Conservatism that is built into this empiricism uh, can be downgraded if we do adequate analysis for specific solicitations. I gave you an example of uh, overtopping, co-overtopping, an earthquake is for another lecture. And uh, we should use, when we do the modeling, it's very important that we keep in mind the 3M approach. 3M approach is doing material definition, material characterization, monitoring, and modeling. And this has to be interrelated. Yesterday, Fong told me I should have called that from the 3M approach to the 4M approach. The last, the 4M, he put in the middle and he called it maintenance. So, but I agree, maintenance is, is a key issue. A maintenance plan that is well thought is, is really saving your dams for, for long times because you actually go away. It's like a doctor, you, you try to establish its, its health. Acknowledgements, of course, organizing committee of Geo Quebec, uh, selection committee for having selected me. The Canadian Geotechnical Society, because I think it's a good idea to have such a lecture. Uh, most important acknowledgement go to my students and collaborators. I must say, uh, Ibrahim Soud did his PhD and he's still doing it, he's writing up in, at CCOR with uh, Ryan Phillips, unfortunately, isn't here, but I think he would have liked what I said about the centrifuge. Stéphane Coté, who did the work on internal erosion, suffusion. Pierre-Olivier Dunn for the contact erosion, and he has the last presentation of this conference in, in, on Wednesday. So if you want to, to see more about that, go and see him. Vincent Castingway for the numerical modeling, Saberi, and, and Vincent Cormier for the rock fill and uh, and uh, other simulations. My collaborators, of course, the co-chair of our research chair is uh, Jean Coté. Professor uh, Annan is working uh, with uh, Mia Tsaberi on uh, Tulnustuk Dam, it's uh, CFRD. Uh, Dr. Mark Smith, I worked with Mark since he did his uh, master thesis under my supervision a long time ago. And he's the key. He gives me all this nice data to look at and to think about. Dr. Simon Grenier from Caritas, and uh, that has done a lot of simulation with FLAC for during the design uh, stage of uh, Roman 2. And then a uh, close team, uh, Dr. Marc Lebeau, Gilbert, and uh, Boisvert that are members of our research chair. And last and not least, uh, to our uh, IRC partners, and CERC. Of course, Hydro-Québec is the biggest contributor. Université Laval, they somehow pay my salary. Then we have uh, SNC-Lavalin and Calitas, WSP, uh, ACOM, Contech, Gold Associates, Clone Crippen, and recently Hatch joined. Uh, since we did work on the centrifuge in, in Newfoundland, I can say I probably have the only chair here that is from coast to coast. Thank you very much. I think uh, I, I finished. Merci, Jean. Marie, for a very excellent presentation and with ample clarity. 
It's my great pleasure and privilege to thank you, Jean-Marie, uh, a good friend and highly respected colleague. When I think of Jean-Marie, there's a few words that come to mind. First one is passionate. He, that's that's Jean-Marie. He's energetic. He's very inquisitive, always questions why. He's strategic. And once he latches onto something, he's extremely focused. And he's done many uh, research thus in his, uh, in his career. Anyway, thank you very much, Jean-Marie, for an excellent Aram Hardy address.